John Toman. Yeah, can people hear me in the back? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is John Toman. Today I'll be presenting work I've done with Dan Grossman at the University of Washington on Concerto. But before I dive into that, I wanna very quickly review the absolute triumph of abstract interpretation, which has shown how we use this beautiful mathematical theory to gain um, static proofs about programs runtime behavior. And further advances in this field have shown how to extend abstract interpretation to precisely handle many of the features we see in the program here on the left. So as members of the abstract interpretation community, we can all agree that abstract interpretation is an invaluable tool that developers can and should be using to gain rigorous guarantees about their program's correctness. However, we can also agree that abstract interpretation is not as widely used today as perhaps it should be. And why might that be? Well, one potential problem is that reflection and metaprogramming can confound even state-of-the-art abstract interpreters. To see why, let's consider this simple example. Well, here we're performing some reflective invocation where the name of the method we're calling has been read from some non-deterministic source. Now, to be sound, we have to make worst case assumptions about what we're calling, including every single method defined in the application. This is bad enough as it is, but if one of these methods also contains a reflective invocation about which we must also make worst case assumptions, we end up with this Byzantine call graph which can overwhelm our abstract interpreter, destroying both precision and soundness. Now, at this point, we might comfort ourselves by asking who uses reflection? Unfortunately, the answer is almost every modern application, albeit indirectly. And to see why, let's consider what it would take to move this program onto, say, the web. This requires adding support for a host of auxiliary functionality, including caching, database access, session management. And very often, the size and complexity of these features can outstrip the uh, complexity of that core application itself. Now, luckily, developers don't have to implement all this functionality themselves. Instead, they can rely on what are called frameworks, which are the scaffoldings onto which an application is built. Now, these frameworks have implementations for all this auxiliary functionality, uh, allowing the developer to focus on the core application. But because these frameworks need to support many, many different types of applications, they also must be extremely flexible. And this flexibility does come with a cost, namely the pervasive use of reflection and metaprogramming, many, many layers of abstraction. And more perniciously, all of this difficult to analyze program behavior is very often driven by non-executable, non-code artifacts, such as configuration files and annotations. So modern abstract interpreters will often struggle to precisely analyze framework-based applications. And this is what's motivated our work on Concerto which is a hybrid analysis framework that enables the precise analysis of framework-based applications. And the, one of the key ideas behind our work is that although frameworks are difficult to analyze statically, once given some of this concrete configuration information, they often take a single deterministic path or handful of paths of execution. And further, this configuration information is very often available to us at analysis time. So rather than try to statically analyze the framework behavior, we can simply provide it with its configuration information, run it, and observe the results. And this is the idea behind how Concerto handles frameworks. To analyze the application code, we use our old friend abstract interpretation. But when the application then calls into the framework, we then yield into concrete interpretation. And when I say concrete interpretation, I do mean we're just running the framework code. But because of that insight we just saw, we can simply have the framework access its configuration, take its single deterministic path or handful of paths of execution, and then observe the results. Now when the framework then calls back into the application, we then yield back into abstract interpretation. And this process can continue across nested calls and returns. Now, it's not quite as simple as I made it appear on the slide. We can't just spawn a new Java virtual machine, but this is effectively the approach we use. And now we formalized a variant of concrete interpretation within abstract interpretation itself and proved that this combined approach is sound. And further, because we're in the theory of abstract interpretation, we can enforce termination with winding. And further, we've proved that in some conditions, you can expect provably improved precision over using standard abstract interpretation techniques. Now, there's one more piece we need to make this work in practice, and that is the state separation hypothesis which states that frameworks and applications rarely manipulate each other's state directly. Now, to see why this is true, consider that in a language like Java, the majority of application state is in object fields. So to validate this hypothesis, we looked at two large frameworks, Spring and Struts, and simply counted how many of those fields had public visibility. And of the 12,000 or so fields, only 0.5% had public visibility. So by the very language rules of Java itself, code outside of the framework, that is the application, was forbidden from mutating the vast majority of framework state. And this is a rather strict hypothesis to assume of entire programs, and we do have support for when this hypothesis does not hold. But when it does, this will enable the sharing of values between a concrete and abstract interpreter in an opaque manner. So Concerto then is a principle of combination of con uh, concrete and abstract interpretation that can precisely analyze framework-based applications, and it's what I'll elaborate on for the remainder of this talk. I'll first give an idea of how Concerto works by walking through a quick example, and then provide a preview of the formalism we've presented in our paper. And then I'll present the results of some initial experiments we've done with a proof of concept implementation. So for this example, we're going to assume we have this simple application, which is reading an integer from a non-deterministic source, and if the value read is negative, it calls absolute value, and the value read is, uh, uh, excuse me, if the value read is negative, it's uh, 
calls absolute value, and if the value rate is positive, it calls square root. Now we can't call square root with a negative argument. If we do, we'll reach this fail statement. We want to verify that this never occurs. Now the world's simplest sign-inness analysis can actually verify this property. But suppose now the application is written against some framework, which consists of this main procedure, which first calls init, which reads the uh, framework state from a configuration file, encapsulates it in M, and returns it to main. Main then invokes the application entry point passing in this framework state. We're next going to replace these two direct calls to absolute value and square root with two calls to dispatch. And intuitively, here we're calling the negative value and positive value handler as indicated by the static string arguments. Now, dispatch is implemented in the framework and first performs some logging as a stand-in for the more complicated functionality you'll find in real-world frameworks. Then, based on the uh, framework state passed in by the application, dispatch uses this reflective invoke operation to call the procedure corresponding to the requested handler. Now, ultimately, the procedures we call here will just be square root and absolute value, but we've removed all syntactic indication that these are the procedures we're calling from within the application's main loop. So that's it for the uh, program we'll use in this example. For the abstract interpreter, we'll use a simple interprocedural sinus analysis, which uses uh, imprecise semantics and representation for any feature that is not an integer. And this abstract interpreter cannot precisely analyze the combined application framework we just saw. So, First, framework state is read from a configuration file and then passed to application code. And the application then reflectively invokes itself via the framework. And we now want to show how we can verify that that fail statement is unreachable by combining concerto with a very simple sign in this analysis. So let's see how this works. So we begin execution in framework's main procedure, which means we begin by performing concrete interpretation. So we start by calling this init procedure, which performs some IO operations to open and read a configuration file. Now we have the static name of this configuration file, which we assume is available to us at analysis time. And notice that this configuration file also contains the precise mapping of handler names to procedures. Now, in this example, this mapping is relatively simple, but in practice, this can be an arbitrarily complex domain-specific language or XML format or what have you. But even if that's the case, because we're performing concrete interpretation, we can simply open, read, and parse this mapping so that when we reach this call to the application here, we do so in a state where we have the precise mapping of handler names to procedures that indicates that the positive value handler is square root and the negative value handler is absolute value. So now we're going to call into the application, which means we need to yield into abstract interpretation. But we do need an abstract value for this parameter. But remember, we made a call here in a uh, state where the argument was this concrete map. So what do we do? We're actually going to directly embed this concrete map into the abstract interpreter. We're going to reuse the concrete value in the abstract interpreter. Now, how can we do this without also requiring that the abstract interpreter have some interpretation of this concrete representation? And this is where that state separation hypothesis comes into play. Remember, this says that the framework state is opaque to the application implementation and vice versa. In other words, the framework state is manipulated only in the framework and similarly for the application state. So we can embed this concrete map, which is part of the framework state, into the abstract state, confident that the abstract interpreter, which is only used on application code, will never reach a situation where it needs to manipulate or understand this concrete representation. In other words, the abstract interpreter can be agnostic to the concrete representation of values and vice versa. And we'll see in just a little bit how we can also embed an abstract value into a concrete interpreter in just a little bit. So after beginning abstract interpretation, we'll reach this call to dispatch here in an abstract state that indicates that x is some arbitrary negative integer. So here we're calling back into the framework, which means we need to yield once again into the concrete interpreter. We need values for all of these arguments or parameters. For this first parameter, we can simply extract the previously embedded uh, uh, concrete map. For the second, we can reuse the static handler name. And for this final parameter, we can simply reuse the abstract uh, value from the uh, callee's abstract state. Again, we can once again perform this embedding thanks to this state separation hypothesis, as this final parameter is part of the application state and thus not mutating the framework. So our concrete interpreter does not need any sort of interpretation or semantics or any way of understanding this embedded abstract value. Now notice because we've actually embedded this abstract value, we're technically no longer performing fully concrete interpretation, but what we call mostly concrete interpretation. And I'll define this in just a little bit. So after performing logging, we reach this invoke operation, which reflectively calls the procedure name given by this argument, which is simply the handler's corresponding procedure name recorded in the framework state. But because we're doing this operation in a state where we have both the precise representation of the mapping and the handler name, we can easily resolve this to just the absolute value procedure. Now we're going to once again yield into abstract interpretation, and we need an abstract value for this parameter, but again, we can just reuse the previously embedded abstract value. Now notice that we had imprecisely resolved this uh, call to be square root and begun inter uh, analysis with this abstract argument. We would have falsely conclude that this fail statement is reachable, which is a false positive. But because we were using this precise concrete semantics and representation to model the framework code, we can rule out this call, avoiding the false positive. So Conchera then is interleaved mostly concrete and abstract interpretation, which relies on this state separation hypothesis 
which allows us to embed concrete values opaquely into an abstract interpreter and embed abstract values opaquely into a mostly concrete interpreter. So I want to sketch how we make this process more formal as presented in our paper. This will have three pieces, how we formalize this state separation, how we define this mostly concrete interpretation, and then how we define our combined interpretation. So to define our state separation, we define a language that has a syntactic partition of code into framework and application statements. And we do this by inducing a partition on the labels used to identify program statements. We then syntactically restrict the framework code from directly mutating the framework state and vice versa for application code. And when I say framework code, I do mean the statements that are labeled with framework labels and similarly for the application. Now we uh, define the syntactic restriction based on the types of values. We assume that there is a partition of the uh, types of the program into framework types and application types. And we restrict the framework code to only the operations that manipulate values of framework types and similarly for the application. For the rest of the section, I'm going to assume we have the following uh, definitions. We have our concrete states, which are a map from variables to values. We have our concrete semantics, which simply uh, compute the possible states that reach a uh, label. Uh, so our abstract, or excuse me, our domain of concrete properties uh, is this map from labels to sets of concrete states. We also have a domain of abstract states, and we have a Galois connection between our concrete properties and abstract properties, which is a map from labels to abstract states. And then finally, we have our abstract semantics, uh, which are sound with respect to this Galois connection. So I now want to define mostly concrete interpretation, but before I do, I want to review why we actually need to do this. We saw one reason already, which is that we need to embed abstract values representing infinite sets of concrete values into a concrete interpreter. And we saw this when we had this called a dispatch here. Remember, x was this abstract value which represents an infinite set of negative integers, and we can't concretize this, not in a meaningful way. But another reason is that we do need to support non-determinism in the framework. Although there are operations that we can reasonably expect to execute at analysis time and get the same results at runtime, this is not going to be the case for all operations in the framework. So we do need to have some notion of non-determinism. So at a high level, mostly concrete semantics, or just the concrete semantics, extend to support sets of possible values, a non-deterministic unknown value, star if you're familiar with that uh, notation, and finally abstract values that have been embedded and provided by the abstract interpreter. So to find mostly concrete semantics, I'm first going to find our mostly concrete states, uh, which is S tilde, and this is going to have two components. The first component is a representation of the framework state, that is the values of variables with framework types. We represent these variables values with sets of uh, framework values, which are extended with this special non-deterministic uh, value. And together, this set representation and this non-deterministic value are what we use to handle non-determinism. And again, we can make this uh, distinction between uh, variables of framework type and values of framework type uh, because we have this type information, this partition on the types. So we do need a representation for the application state, but remember that application values are produced by application code, which is ultimately analyzed with abstract interpretation. So in other words, mostly concrete interpreter does not need its own uh, representation for the application state. So we rely on an opaque value representation provided by the abstract interpreter. So uh, now with that definition, we can define our mostly concrete semantics, which operates over this mostly concrete domain, uh, which simply maps uh, program statements to uh, mostly concrete states. Uh, and our mostly concrete semantics are just the concrete semantics that have been lifted to uh, support framework operations uh, over sets of possible values and non-determinism. Now we do need a semantics for the operations that occur in the application code. And for these, we can just imprecisely yield the maximal element of this opaque representation. Now this is very imprecise, but remember we only use mostly concrete interpretation on the framework code. So in practice, we never actually observe this imprecision, but it does let us prove soundness. In fact, we can define a Galois connection between our concrete properties and our mostly concrete properties, and then prove that this is uh, sound with respect to our, uh, this Galois connection uh, and our concrete semantics. And so what I want to stress here is that mostly concrete interpretation is just a special kind, as with all things, of abstract interpretation. Uh, and this is also why we can use widening to ensure that our uh, execution in the framework code uh, terminates. And you can see the paper for details there. So now we're ready to define uh, combined interpretation. And at this point, we now have two abstract interpreters with their own semantics, domains, and Galois connections. And what we want is a combined domain, a combined semantic function, a combined Galois connection that lets us prove that this whole combined approach is sound. Now to uh, define our combined domain, given that partition of our uh, uh, program labels into framework statements and application statements, we can define our combined domain as, again, the product of two maps. The first represents states in the framework with the mostly concrete states and states in the application with abstract states. So with that definition of combined domain, it's relatively simple to define a combined Galois connection. And the combined semantic function, 
which also uh, shows our formalism of how we do this embedding of values is rather technical, and I do not have time to get into it here, but it is in our paper if you're interested. But the main result is that this combined approach is actually sound with respect to that combined Galois connection. And again, the proof is in the paper, along with several details that I've just not had time to go into here today, including how we handle termination with widening, how we handle procedures, and so on. So I now want to present the results of some experiments we've done with an initial proof of concept. And our goals here were to show the benefits of combined interpretation by targeting a Java-like object-oriented language. And we wanted to show the flexibility of this approach by incorporating multiple abstract interpreters. So to show this, we implemented a framework called Yawn, which is your analysis's worst nightmare. It's a framework that supports implicit flow, reflective object graph construction, and an embedded Lisp interpreter with a foreign function interface implemented with reflection. Uh, these are all features that we have found in real-world frameworks. Um, worse, all of these uh, features rely heavily on reflection in their implementation, and all of them depend on the contents of a configuration file to determine their behavior. So to evaluate Concerto, we wrote a simple web application against this Yawn framework. We implemented three abstract interpreters and then compared the results of running the abstract interpreters alone and with Concerto. So the abstract interpreters themselves target three uh, familiar problem domains and they use different context, strat context sensitivity strategies, uh, value representations, heap representations, and analysis strategies. Um, they also all soundly handle reflection, however, and they will make worst case assumptions when they don't have any extra information. And this causes problems when we run them alone. Um, two of the abstract interpreters time out after one hour and have produced multiple false positives when this occurs. The points to analysis does finish, but it takes 20 minutes and produces a call graph of extremely low quality. On the other hand, when we use Concerto, all of the analyses finish in under 10 seconds. The two bug finding analyses uh, do not produce any false positives, and the points to analysis produces a call graph of much higher quality. And this 4.7 second runtime is 275 times faster than our 20 minute runtime. So I want to close now with a discussion of the related work. There's been a lot of work in statically analyzing how uh, applications use reflective calls. Unfortunately, these also rely on assumptions that are simply not realistic for most frameworks. Uh, there have also been approaches that have combined static and dynamic analyses, but these are generally unsound because they rely on some selected runs of an unsound dynamic analysis. There are also several similarities between our approach and concolic testing, um, but again, concolic testing in general is unsound, where we have this nice soundness result. Now, there's also been some work on analyzing frameworks um, that have generally relied on these manually written models that are very precise but require an enormous amount of effort to construct. Uh, there's been some work on writing frameworks for these framework models, but we hope to avoid this effort completely with this approach. So in conclusion, Concerto is a principled framework for hybrid, mostly concrete and abstract interpretation that is formalized within the theory of abstract interpretation, relying on this novel state separation hypothesis. And we evaluated an implementation that gave us enormous improvements to analysis precision and performance over a framework that was inspired by real framework features. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and welcome any questions that you have. Thanks. I want to start with an anonymous question in Slido. How do you ensure that the private fields are not modified by the outside library using public methods? In other words, encapsulation, what justifies that in your hypothesis? That's a, separation? That's a great question. So a private field that is modified by a setter, essentially, uh, when the application calls that setter, that is a call into framework code. So at that point, we will then yield into mostly concrete interpretation. And so we do allow that modification, but that modification is being performed by the framework code on behalf of, uh, excuse me, on behalf of the application. So at that point, although we will be manipulating a, um, we'll be uh, mutating the framework state, uh, that setter is running in mostly concrete interpretation under the concrete semantics. Thank you for the talk. Um, you said that there is a partition between the labels of the framework and the application. So both of these are very differently treated in your assert interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, does this mean that you think that it's mostly concrete interpretation has no usefulness in the uh, uh, application? Uh, I, yeah, you could have certainly imagined that you could also just try to run the mostly concrete interpreter in parallel with the abstract interpreter. Uh, that is something that uh, we have considered but not yet implemented. But it's certainly possible that you could um, do that. Um, I, based on how we've set up the separation of values as well, it's unclear what extra value, because we've assumed that the mostly concrete semantics, which are really designed to operate over the framework state, which we assume is not being mutated inside of the application, um, it's sort of unclear what extra benefit, but there certainly might be applications that we haven't considered that, where that might be useful. Very nice talk, wonderfully clear. 
thank you. um you were very clear about having this separation of things and you gave some documentation that that's mostly true but there were a few times it wasn't true so what happens then uh right so the cases where it is not true uh particularly in practice is the um handling of primitive values right there are cases where you would not want to restrict your framework only the framework to allowing uh to allow you only the framework to modify integers that would be totally unrealistic um we do have some support for that common case uh where we have to have some shared understanding of how the application of the framework view uh their primitive values um in particular the uh framework or excuse me the abstract interpreter can optionally export some um semantics for allowing the uh framework to perform addition and other primitive operations over abstract um integers uh in the cases where we where there's direct modification of the framework's heap we you have to fall back on relatively conservative uh uh assumptions you have to have it field values and things like that there's your precision goes down but we expect that to be so rare in practice that it's not really a concern for us okay i'm afraid i have to cut things off at this point keep on track with time thanks again yeah.